No doubt the most beloved hymn of all times is Amazing Grace, penned in 1792 by John Newton, a former slave, slip, slave ship master who became an Anglican priest. Although Amazing Grace is his most recognized hymn, he actually wrote 300 different songs over the course of his life. Eventually, he worked with the British parliamentarian, William Wilberforce, to help end the British slave trade. A number of historians have noted how the simple and yet profound lyrics of Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace, reflect a, a heart that's been transformed. As he himself wrote, I once was lost, but am now found, was blind, but now I see. The hymn is a, a message not only of redemption, but also of hope, as he says. The Lord hath promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Several years ago, Michael Flaherty, who is a Hollywood producer, who's been a good friend of Gordon College, spoken here many times, worked with his colleagues at Walden Media to produce a major motion picture on the life of William Wilberforce, and the name of the movie was Amazing Grace. They contracted with Chris Tomlin, the singer-songwriter, to add a little bridge to the iconic hymn. Tomlin wrote, My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood... His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The last six months have been a very strange mix of emotions in the Lindsay household. We have felt the deep love and grace of this place. It's been our home for 10 years. And like everybody who comes to encounter Gordon College, this institution has left an indelible mark on our souls that we will forever treasure. After all, Caroline and Emily learned how to ride their bike on the long driveway leading up to Wilson House and on the sidewalk around the quad. To this day, Elizabeth, one of her favorite spots on campus is the bench swing that's just outside of Jinx. I've lear learned a lot from my many mistakes, both seen and unseen, and am very grateful for the grace that's been extended to us by the faculty and staff, the students and the community through it all. I don't deserve it but I'm really grateful for it. We're going to miss so many things about this very special place. The strawberry dippers over in Lane, the Christmas gala that we love every year, the excitement and energy and beauty of this place that's in the spring at graduation or in the fall at orientation. But the thing we're going to miss the most are the extraordinary people that we've come to love at Gordon College. You see, Gordon is an amazing place, but it's made better every year by the cohort that the Lord brings to be part of our community. And so many of them have been dear to us. Of course, Gordon, like every place, is not perfect. And we faced a lot of challenges along the way. But I take a lot of comfort from the admonition that the scripture that Bob read just a minute ago from Eugene Peterson's translation of 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter says, If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think it can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ, your master. Keep your hearts at attention, he says. Other translations say, in your hearts, set apart Christ. The book of 1 Peter was actually written to Christians in a particular crucible. The author was the passionate, mercurial disciple of Jesus who walked on water at the master's command, but also denied him three times in a moment when it mattered a great deal. We see that in chapter 1, Peter writes this epistle to those who are grieved by various trials. He reminds them of the hope that we have in Christ and emphasizes how that hope, which is grounded in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, gives us confidence that Christ will carry us through all of our trials and difficult moments. We can cast all our cares upon God, as we're told in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, because he cares for us. And even though there is an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion, it is God who gets the last word. And because of that, we know that he will eventually make all things right. In the in-between time, while we're waiting for that to occur, we're admonished to bear witness to Jesus. 
We believe that Peter wrote this particular epistle from Rome somewhere around 60 to 64 AD. It was in the very season when persecution of Christians was on the rise throughout the Roman Empire. But even in that context, Peter tells us not to retaliate. In verse 9 he says, Do not repay evil for evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay, repay evil with blessing. Peter admonished us to continue doing good, to continue on. Why? Because we have been blessed in order to be a blessing. You know, the way of Jesus is very much countercultural. If we think about how he related to the authorities, it's kind of interesting. Even though his disciples were goading him to speak out against the power or the rulers of his age, Jesus never once did that. And yet, clearly he was not impressed by them. It was... Jesus, after all, who said to render unto Caesar what Caesar's and unto God what is God's. The model of Christ is one of patience as well as forbearance under suffering. He was, after all, the suffering servant that was foretold in the book of Isaiah. Gentleness, meekness, and humility are not things that we typically associate with Christianity in our culture today. If I'm being honest, they're not necessarily virtues that people always associate with me. And yet, that is exactly what we are called to embody in our collective witness. There's a biblical ideal that's had some cultural purchase from time to time. In our lifetime, it's under the phrase of WWJD. But in the early days of Gordon's founding, back in the 19th century, it came in the form of a little novel that was published by a guy named Charles Sheldon. He took from um, the book of 1 Peter this idea of writing a book that was entitled In His Steps, with a subtitle of What Would Jesus Do? The book became a bestseller, selling over 50 million copies of the book. The main character in the book is the Reverend Henry Maxwell, who one day challenged his fictional congregation to take an entire year where they don't do a single thing without first asking the question, what would Jesus do? The book relates the stories of various congregants who grapple with that admonition in their everyday life. One character decides to leave his job after he dis discovers that his company is committing serious fraud. Another character decides to try and make an initiative to try and improve a seedy part of town with some real estate development. And in the process, changes the feel of the place for good. The call to righteous living is as old as the Bible, and yet the temptation to fall away is also as old. I used to believe that life involved a series of chapters, one that would be filled with challenge and disappointment, but the next one that would be followed with a message of joy or redemption. I guess I believed the American dream-like version of the gospel that suggested eventually the story is going to get better and better. We may have roadblocks along the way, but it's going to consistently get better. But in my 10 years serving as Gordon's president, I've become convinced actually that the way of Jesus entails a lot more suffering than I care to acknowledge. See, I've always been a glass half full kind of person. I've always loved the book of Philippians, the book of joy in the New Testament. I've always been drawn to the story of Nehemiah or Joseph, who in the end experienced God's redemption and uh, they triumph in the end in such a way that godly good gets done. But we're, we are reminded every year during Holy Week that even on Jesus' high point of that week, when he's making the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he doesn't come in on a chariot or a steed, but instead on a lowly donkey. Jesus was not tried in the way that would be good, right, or fitting. It was a trial that happened in the middle of the night orchestrated through a shady deal where a disciple betrayed him for just 30 pieces of silver. It's not a great example of how God always takes care of his people. Each year on April 9th, I have a pit in my stomach because it's the anniversary of the execution of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the evangelical pastor who was hung by the Nazis because of his attempt to overthrow Hitler. And it breaks my heart that Bonhoeffer was killed just days before 
his POW camp was freed by American soldiers. Why did God allow that to happen? It makes no sense in the spiritual economy that I would devise. This is the author of great theological works like The Cost of Discipleship and Life Together. He would have done so much good for all of us in the decades following World War II. And yet that's not how it turned out in the upside down world of God's economy. The Christian journey, like Bonhoeffer's untimely death, doesn't always make sense from a human perspective. You see, ours is a God who used the foolish to teach the wise, the mute to bear witness, the poor to be rich in God's kingdom. By now, you know that Rebecca and I have responded to the call of God to move to Indiana this summer for me to assume the presidency of our sister institution, Taylor University. That particular decision came after many months of prayerful consideration and deep discernment and deliberation. We would take prayer walks down to West Beach and back, asking God to guide us. Sometime I hope I have the chance to tell you the remarkable story about the call that God gave to me one evening on a sleepless night. But this morning, I want to share about a deeper, even more personal reality, one that aligns with the story of 1 Peter. I mentioned earlier that I've spent much of my Christian life thinking that we go through different chapters, one where there is... Um, sadness or disappointment or challenge, but it's always followed by a chapter of joy and redemption. But it turns out that's not really the way the Christian life works. Instead, it's more like going down dual parallel tracks. Often we experience the two tracks of both blessing and burden at the same time. I first encountered this story and this idea from the pastor Rick Warren in California. Back in the early 2000s, he wrote a book that became a widely best-selling book. In fact, it sold more copies than any other book ever published except for the Bible. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. I was actually invited to a party that was given um, in Rick Warren's honor by Rupert Murdoch, the Fox News chairman. It was on top of the world at 30 Rockefeller Plaza in the Rainbow Room. It was a moment of great professional achievement for Pastor Warren. And yet at that very moment, that very moment when he was achieving the pinnacle of professional success, he was carrying a very deep burden because his wife Kay was battling cancer, although that was not widely known. And even more quiet was the fact that his son was deeply struggling with depression. From a distance, I assumed that Rick was having an amazing run to a terrific lifetime of service to God when on the inside he was deeply struggling with the burden that he was facing at the prospect of losing his wife and maybe even his son. The day before my final interview for the presidency at Taylor University, which took place about a month ago, our family experienced an unspeakable tragedy some of you are aware that 10 years ago, my younger cousin Trent was killed in a car accident. Since I'm an only child, my cousins have always been extremely important to me. Losing him was like losing a little brother. He was 32 at the time, leaving behind a wife and three young kids. It was actually his death and the realization that we're not promised tomorrow that compelled me to decide to apply for the presidency at Gordon, never thinking that I would get it. I was just going to throw my hat into the ring because I didn't want another opportunity to pass me by. Given the role that Trent's untimely death played in my calling to Gordon, it was unthinkable that another tragedy would be part of my journey to Taylor. But for some reason, that's what occurred. The day before my final interview, his older sister, my cousin Kelly, was killed in a similarly freakish auto accident. Like her brother, she was killed not by anything that she did wrong. Her vehicle just happened to be in the wrong place at precisely the wrong moment. And in that hinge moment, at age 49, she was struck down in the prime of her life. That occurred one month ago, last Thursday. Now my Aunt Kay and Uncle Ron 
have lost both of their children. And just as I don't understand why Bonhoeffer was taken just days before he was going to be freed, I also, if I'm speaking very honestly, do not understand why this tragedy would come to my family, and especially to my aunt and uncle, or to the beloved spouses of my cousins and their kids. I share this because if you look at my life and think about what's been going on in the last month, you might think that everything is all rosy and happy, much as I might assume the same about you. But the reality is that each of us carry around within us scars and burdens that sometimes we don't even share with those around us. I also don't know what blessing you might be experiencing, and it's entirely possible that you're traveling down the two tracks of burden and blessing at the very same time. But we're admonished in 1 Peter to have endurance, of being ready to bear witness no matter the circumstances, because sometimes the burden in God's economy actually gets redeemed to be a part of a much larger blessing. If only we have the eyes to see it that way. I wish I could say that I had it all figured out, but even this morning my heart is very heavy. I'm excited about the move to Taylor and about the opportunity to do something new. I'm eager to figure out who my successor is. I still don't know who that is. And yet at the same time, there are parts of my heart that are very sad. We're admonished in this passage not to allow that sadness or grief to get us to a place of deep worry or anxiety, but instead to cast all our cares on God because he cares for us. We're admonished to set our hearts on Christ because through this, we're actually brought closer to God. We're called to bear witness to our faith, to be ready to give an account for anyone who asks for the hope that we have within us. For 10 years, it's been a remarkable blessing to be part of the Gordon community. All of the Lindsays will miss you guys dearly. As I thought about my very last chance to speak in Gordon's chapel and perhaps a closing parable that I might be able to share, I was struck by how often the Lord has used sometimes the very simple things in my life to make some of the most profound points. I've not spoken very often about the journey that Rebecca and I have had of parenting Elizabeth, our oldest daughter. But most of you know that she has severe special needs due to a rare genetic disorder. There is no known cure for Elizabeth. And despite the prayers that I pray every single day, the transformational healing of Elizabeth has not yet occurred. And she's now 17. It's likely that she will never speak or be able to be independent on her own like you or me. But like every teenager, Elizabeth definitely has preferences, and she's found ways to communicate that to us. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6 that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth will speak. Faith in Christ is important to all of us. In Elizabeth's case, she may not have the same means to communicate that. And yet, she still is able to bear witness. Elizabeth attends just an amazing special needs school that's located not too far from campus in Beverly called the Ch Children's Center for Communication. It's not a faith-based school. It's, uh, like most places, filled with folks of different faith and of no faith at all. But something special can happen when we are willing to give an account for the hope that we have within us. For her, it comes as Elizabeth is able to share the amazing grace that we have in Jesus Christ. She's able to share that with her classmates and teachers by her favorite music video by an acapella group called Noteworthy. We made a short little video to share a little bit about Elizabeth's story. Let's watch it now. We are told not to be afraid when we encounter burdens or challenges, but instead to bear witness to our faith in Christ. If a sweet kid who has no real language can point to others to the amazing grace that we have in Jesus Christ, how much more so ought we to be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have within us? This was true for the slave trader turned priest, John Newton. It was true for Charles Sheldon, the author, for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for Rick Warren, for Elizabeth, 
for you and for me. May we be a community traveling together down those two tracks of blessing and burden, but bearing witness to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the amazing grace that we have come to experience through the redemption of Jesus Christ and the redemptive work that you have done in and through so many people who have walked alongside us through the blessings and burdens. Thank you for the community of Gordon. What a great place it is. Be with us now. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you all.